Alrighty, my friends, welcome. Here we are. It is now the 2nd of April here in New Zealand. I know many of you are probably still in the 1st, so uh, happy April Fool's Day. Um, although it's unlikely to be the morning of the 1st anymore, anywhere, much, maybe Hawaii. Um, you can still play a trick if you're in Hawaii, Alaska, or parts of Russia. Otherwise, you shit out of luck because it's the afternoon of April the 1st or early in the morning of the 2nd as it is here, 9am, welcome, Saturday. Drops of Light, Montara Transformation Empowerment Support Community weekly live stream, roughly about an hour, hopefully a little less, hopefully not too much longer, um, to talk about whatever you might wanna know. I'm just trying to find where I put my post up. They only got seen by 15 people. That's interesting, I wonder if that's because it's a, a well-used photo from Facebook. Not one of mine, obviously. It's um, something I <laughs> pinched because I found it quite amusing. Um, you know, it says, what is the secret to eternal happiness? Someone's asking the guru, what's the secret to eternal happiness? And the guru says, do not argue with fools. Oh, do not argue with fools. And the guy says, well, I disagree. <laughs> and the guru says, of course. Well, <laughs> yes, of course you were right. Because <laughs> he's not going to argue with the fool, right? Um, and so it, it, I found it a little bit topical because uh, talking this month about um, peace, right, and, and keeping the peace and doing it in an empowered way, right, uh, so not needing to create an argument for the sake of being right, but still we want to maintain sovereignty. This is the big thing that I sort of recognised when I was considering myself this idea of being an advocate for peace, that quite often that can turn into a very disempowered relationship that can, and, you know, turn into uh, people pleasing, it can turn into self sacrifice, where you are sacrificing yourself in order to keep the peace in order to avoid conflict. And as I spoke last night on the new moon call, which I would encourage you all to listen to, um, because in my opinion, it's probably the best um, light language call I've ever done, probably, I think. I've got a pretty bad memory, but, but it seemed pretty good. I was, I was, uh, I was impressed with what came through. Um, and, and that's not, not guaranteed. Right? I'm not always impressed with what comes through. Sometimes it feels a little bit lackluster to me. Um, which is interesting because quite, I do often receive good compliments on the, on the uh, on on the transmissions that I was feeling a little bit blah dur during, so that's also <laughs> no guarantee. Maybe this was received by everyone blah, and I thought it was great. But anyway, uh, iris <laughs> I'd encourage you to give me some feedback. So have a listen to it and see what you think. It's not terribly long. I think it's forty minutes in total, and that includes about ten or fifteen minutes of introduction and then the light language transmission. And it is up in good quality because I recorded it on my good quality recorder and then uploaded it straight after the call. So it should be quite good to listen to with no interference, etc., etc. Um, but the point is, I was talking about on that call about finding this empowered relationship with peace so that we don't need to avoid conflict in order to be peaceful. Because in avoiding conflict, we're not going to progress, right? Conflict is a necessary part of evolution, both internal conflict, right? Because conflict is what drives us to change, right? We recognize that aspects of ourselves are not the way that we desire to be. That in itself is a conflict between our soul's desire and our ego desire, right? This conflict is always occurring. But the point is, can we move through conflict peacefully, Right, because a lot of people think peace is the absence of conflict, and I'm, I'll tell you that it's not. Peace is the absence of aggression and violence. Right. So, can we move through conflict without needing to become aggressive, without needing to become forceful, without needing to become violent in any sort of way? Not just physically punch up violent, but you know, violence is basically this this mm, projection of aggressive, forceful energy, do it my way or else, right? This threat. 
And quite often this is instigated by fear, right? It, it's that fear drives people to be aggressive. Love drives people to be, um, uh, what is it when you, com compromise is one word, but there's another word that comes before compromise. When we negotiate, right? Negotiation, compromise, there's still another word that hasn't come to me. But anyway, it will. It's, I think it starts with C as well. Consider it. It's not the word I was looking for, but, it, but but that's part of it, right? When we consider part, you know, what other people are saying rather than blindly sort of say, no, that's, you know, <laughs> that's against my belief, right? Are we willing to have our beliefs, our opinions challenged, right? It, it requires that for us to progress because if we're not willing to have, you know, that level of conflict, that level of um challenge in our life then then we're going to stay very very stuck and ironically that level of stuckness produces fear of anything different to the way that we are now rigidly believing that then induces a violent or an aggressive response to people who do challenge us good morning sister or good after good evening sister betty over there in france i presume you're in france I haven't heard on the grapevine that you've uh, gone home, gone home, gone back to the States for a visit. Um, so, yeah, so it's going to be interesting, I feel, the, the, working this month with this idea of, of sovereignty and peace, right? Maintaining our confidence in ourselves, being willing to negotiate and um, commune, communicate uh, through the process of conflict, right, without having to become aggressive and forceful so that we can be peaceful and loving in our negotiations through conflicting uh, situations, right? And that includes having the conflicting situations within ourselves where we're being challenged about our own rigidities, our own beliefs, and we find conflict, right? We all have internal conflict, about what we should do in any situation because we've all been uh, educated with a variety of different opinions, right? We have the education from our parents. We have the education from our school. Now, they're not always the same. A <laughs> school can be telling you to do things differently to the way your parents tell you to do them. And then you've got your peers who are also influencing you and educating you and basically indoctrinating you with shoulds, the way they think it should be done. And then so you're conflicted internally about who you're appeasing in any particular situation. And then, of course, if you dig a little deeper, you'll have your own soul-based you know, desires and beliefs and understandings? And are you listening to those? And they're quite often in conflict to what society is telling you you should do to be happy, to be successful, to be right, to be compliant, right? Do we need to be compliant in order to maintain peace? Or can we be a peaceful advocate for what we believe as a sovereign being is uh, more in alignment with with the truth, our truth, the truth even, right? So we're always going to have to deal with conflict. Peace, I'll say it again, peace is not the absence of conflict. That's a very, very temporal, temporary peace, right? It, it's kind of like, you know, the peace we have in the absence of distraction when we're talking about this, you know, inner peace that allows us to rest, you, you, you know, that we enjoy during our meditations. The absence of distraction is not the highest form of peace, obviously, as is the absence of conflict is not the form, highest form of peace. The higher form of peace is your ability to be an emanation of peaceful confidence within a lot of distraction, within a lot of conflicting situations. So... Um, this is what we're moving towards, right? This is what we're holding intent for, this empowered version of ourselves that can deal with uh, challenging situations and not lose our inner peace, our inner center, our inner confidence in, in what we are choosing to do. Not in a brash, egoic confidence that it's my way or the highway, but a deeper confidence that we can handle whatever's challenges is arising and we can actually handle the process of having our own strong beliefs challenged 
and potentially evolve them, right? Because we're willing to look at what we've always believed to be true with new perspectives as those new perspectives are presented to us, right? This is this is the process of evolution, being willing to 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 look, to inquire, to to think deeply on and to feel into different points of view that are presented to us. Many people in our society are not willing to look at other points of view because they're scared that if they do look, they will find that the point of view that they've been dogmatically defending might be proved to be incorrect or wrong. And then they would feel like a fool and then they would feel lost and then they would lose a a sense of their persona, right? Because a lot of people identify themselves as their beliefs, right? A lot of people identify themselves as their political alignment. A lot of people identify themselves as their sporting team, for fuck's sake, (laughs) right? Whatever. And if they were to inquire into whether that is a correct thing to do, whether it's a logical thing to do, um, a lot of people use some form of evidence to back up. You know, I remember when I was younger, I was defending my desire to be carnivore, which was basically, you know, the way I'd been brought up. And, and I was meeting, you know, as I entered university and and um, and the film industry, I was meeting people who are vegetarians. Right? This is before I'd even considered being a vegetarian. And I would argue with them that vegetarian is not the natural way to be. I, you know, because I'd been indoctrinated with the idea that these, these pathetic eye teeth were, were for ripping meat and, and, and other belief systems, you know, the, the cavemen and et cetera, et cetera, we'd always eaten meat and, and this was an important part of the human diet, et cetera, et cetera, right? Beliefs that I had held dogmatically, which made me feel better based on the choices that I had made, which were basically choices my parents had made for me and I believed were correct. As we tend to, as children, we tend to believe that our parents are telling us the right thing to do. And if they're feeding us meat, then eating meat is the right thing to do. And then we develop uh, evidence to help back that belief up based on meeting our uh, from, from our perspective on the situation, we find evidence that suits us and then we hold on to that evidence and then we project that evidence out. And when we're challenged at first, we generally, as, as, as egoic beings, uh, defend our point of view, right? We, we, um, we want to back up our point of view because we're scared to have our point of view, something we've always believed in, challenged. Because then that would make us have been wrong in the past. And we don't like that idea. We don't like the idea that I've been wrong for so many years or decades and now I'm going to change. Uh, But if we are willing to open our mind and open our hearts and take information for what it is, then we can be willing to, um, to, to, to challenge our our fundamental beliefs that we've held for a long time um, that have give us a level of foundation and, and, and we identify with, you know, as, as a vegetarian now for me. So I have a whole heap of evidence that backs up why being vegetarian is not just okay, but in preferential, right, from my point of view. If I don't, you know, splay that over everyone, but, but you know, the, those are my beliefs, obviously. That's why I am. Um, choosing that diet, and that's why I have indoctrinated my children with that diet, right? And they will have to come to their own, you know, opportunity to 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 wade through whether that is correct for them or not as they mature and grow, and, and are exposed to a lot of challenges about whether the belief is actually a, a correct one that your parents have have you know indoctrinated you with from childhood. Uh, this is the process. This is the process of evolution. At the end of the day, it's not about whether your belief is the right one or the wrong one. It is your ability to move through the process of evolving with belief systems, right? Because that is what's going to help you. That's what's going to give you. That's what's going to help you be resilient in the world. Hey, Sister Sam. It's going to help you be resilient in the world if you are capable of of inquiring into what you believe and why you believe it and whether you are uh, able to progress that, whether you are able to um, to evolve with that comfortably, right? So it doesn't have to be a complete shit show meltdown, <laughs> breakdown every time you have your, what 
has been a fundamental belief system challenged uh, to the point where you are willing to consider that it might not be the best option for you. It's not that it, whether it's right or it's wrong, because any belief can be right or wrong depending on the perspective that you're holding, right? So it's not about trying to work out whether your belief is right or wrong. It's working out whether your belief is actually benefiting you now in this moment or whether we could potentially soften out of having to defend our beliefs and having our beliefs basically um, choose for us, right? Having our beliefs disempower us out of our ability to make a conscious choice in moments, right? Do we have to be, I'll use the, the vegetarian thing, do we have to be a vegetarian point blank and if we're ever to eat meat, then we would be uh, a hoax or a fool or, or uh, you know, not in alignment, right? Or could we potentially come to the point of view where if I feel like eating meat, I can eat meat and that doesn't detract from the being that I be. Predominantly, I eat a vegetarian diet, but I don't align myself as a vegetarian. It's not a role. It's not a, it's not a title that I need to carry around as vegetarian. I'm someone who eats what I am intuitively guided to eat and that generally is vegetarian food, but sometimes it might not be. Could we get there? I'm not there. I'm a vegetarian. Right? I've been a vegetarian for 25 years. Um, I haven't even considered eating meat. Um, and, and to be honest, it hasn't been appealing. It hasn't been something that's come to my awareness. But has it not been appealing because I identify strongly with being a vegetarian and that identification is powerful enough to override any desire that my body might have, right? Because I'm not really open to the idea that eating meat is okay, personally, I'm not right. I'm willing to. I'm willing to to uh, declare that, uh, admit that, right. That's me right now. Could I evolve out of that? Yes, potentially I could, right. I, I, I'm going through my own process right now with recognizing one of my prime, foundational, fundamental beliefs. How much of that is indoctrination into right versus wrong versus how much of it is my intuitive knowing as to what serves me in, the, in any particular moment, right? And I believe this level of inquiry with all our foundational beliefs, right? I could have the same belief around Catholicism, which is not a big thing for me anymore, being a Catholic, right? I've confirmed and whatever into the Catholic religion, obviously, I don't follow it. But, but as a similar idea, if you had a strong religious bent or a Buddhist or Hindu or, you know, yogi, you know, am I willing to, to look at? Yes, I have been willing to look at all of those religious uh, identifications and, and dilute them to allow myself to become more free flowing with what intuitively feels more beneficial in moments, right? So that area of my life, I've, you know, have a relative degree of fluidity with others, people, potentially some of you not so, you are more rigid in your belief indoctrination around that. And I'm not making it wrong, obviously, not that I make myself wrong for being a quote unquote confirmed vegetarian. Um, I don't see myself as a staunch vegetarian because I don't actually go around trying to uh, apply my beliefs onto others, although I did on my children. But we, I think we all have to do that with our children, right? <laughs> it's very hard to give children free will when they're young because they haven't really developed the, 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 the senses. So we do our best to um, do what we feel is right for them. That is part of the parental role, which is a role that can weigh quite heavy on our shoulders. And sometimes uh, we have to deal with the repercussions of that as they grow into their will and then choose to go against what we have uh, instigated for them earlier on. Very interesting process. Uh, not sure where I'm going with all of this, but it's, it seems to be a uh, rolling conversation. I'm very happy for people to add things in or to even change the topic completely. Uh, please, this is your live stream. <laughs> I'm just ranting, uh, basically waiting for people to show up, but I've been going at it now for 20 minutes. I started with talking about peace and, and sort of morphed into... Um, this 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 ability to to be less um, entrenched in our fundamental foundational belief systems and and labels 
and and all that goes with that and responsibilities, right? The responsibility for being a good vegetarian, right? And not let the team down, <laughs> not go against, not let the label of vegetarian down. <clears throat> isn't, if this is Sam wrote, isn't it interesting how when we make choices that are in alignment with our hearts, we lose the desire to justify our choices to others? Yeah. It's not, yeah, and and I would change the word slightly. It's not we. It's more than we lose the desire to justify. We lose the need to justify our choices to others because when we've made choices from our head based on how we've been indoctrinated or educated, right? When that level of choice that we've chosen to go with something because we have been taught that it's the right thing to do, then we're always needing, because we don't have the alignment in our core and our heart, right? We don't have the deeper foundation to it. So we actually, it's not just a desire to justify our choices, it's an actual need to justify our choices to others because it's more shaky, more shaky. And if we can't justify it to others, and if we can't have others agreeing with it, then we feel even less sure about the choice that we have made or we've been educated into. And that feels scary. This, this is why people who have, are operating from this mental level are so um, aggressive, right? Coming back to the peace topic, are so aggressive with having to prove to you or to anyone else that their belief is correct, right? This is why we see so much aggression coming on various topics that people have chosen to believe the narrative that they have been educated into. So the government educates them into a narrative, just using a, you know, we could use a, a, a certain high profile topic here, which I'm choosing not to, but people can, people who have been educated into that and don't really feel in alignment with it, but they've been overridden, their, their deeper intuitive alignment has been overridden by an indoctrination campaign, they kind of sense that they're on shaky ground. They kind of sense that they don't have a deep foundation in that belief system that they have chosen to go with because it's what everyone else is doing, right? It's the normal thing to do. It's compliant with what you know the authorities want them to do. Then they feel that they need to justify their choice with the argument that they have been presented, right? The which is quite often some very shaky and not very well um, proven facts and figures that they've been presented to that says that they are right, and now they will argumentatively, violently even defend those to others who challenge them because that challenge feels very dangerous to them feels very dangerous. They are triggered by people who are not doing what they are doing. And that worries them because they don't feel 100% in alignment with what they're doing. Their, their heart and their soul is not on board with what they've chosen from their mind to do, which is generally to comply with some form of authorities. Um, thing. We see this religiously too, right? We see this with, you know, quote unquote, the Bible basher um, who has been mentally indoctrinated into their religion, but doesn't really truly feel it in their heart and in their core of, of the, the foundation of their spiritual connection. They are more working from a mental religion where they are following the rules and then they want everyone else to follow the same rules so that they don't feel um, they don't feel challenged by others who seem to be doing okay in the world and not following the rules that they've been told by their religion is essential to 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 be successful and to have salvation and happiness right so it challenges them that others aren't following their rules and so they try to get everyone to follow their rules and they go on great quests to save others, you know, under, under this guise that they're actually being serviceful in trying to indoctrinate others with their belief systems. 
but really they're just trying to they're just trying to bolster and pacify their own inner doubts. That's really what they're doing. So we see this in multiple ways, you know. Um, and again, you know, uh, going back to the, the vegetarian, I, you know, I know a lot of militant vegans who are like this, right? They've made a, a mental choice that they need to be vegan to save the planet, right? And so they've made that choice based on education that they've received. And now they go about trying to make everyone else vegan as well, because that's the only way we're going to save the planet and avoid catastrophe and think about the poor animals and all of their suffering, etc., etc., etc. But they're not really 100% in alignment in their heart with their choice. And we quite often see that these militant vegans, uh, you know, lapse and fall. <laughs> and are easily swayed back because their bodies basically crave other things that they're not giving them and then they tend to eat a lot of, you know, crap trying to be uh, a good vegan when their body's asking for other things. They tend to transition very quickly their diet, right? Overnight, they become a vegan after having a full-blown meat diet and that's a very, very hard thing to do. For me personally, it took me well over six months to slowly wean out just red meat, let alone, you know, other things that came after that. Um, it's the same when I gave up alcohol, which I now haven't given up, ironically, right? So <laughs> at the age of 25, when I started yoga, I you know, came to the conclusion that alcohol was not serving me, you know, and it was taught in yoga that it affects your mind, doesn't help you meditate and has all these negative detrimental effects. And I went, yeah, that's all true. And then it took me a decade, a full decade, to give up alcohol. So yeah, when I, I remember the last beer that I had was at the final day of, of wrapping up after Avatar. So that was that was more than a decade, because that was two thousand and eight, April two thousand and eight, right? Um, and I started yoga in two in ninety six. So you know that was a, a long time. <laughs> So that's when I had my last beer. And then I managed a whole decade or perhaps a little more uh, not touching alcohol at all, right? Finally, finally managed to be completely alcohol free. And then I realized that I was now identifying with someone who didn't drink. And I was a little bit scared that if I had a, a drink, then um, I would have a relapse, right? That it would be a cascade event. And so I had to face that fear. I faced many of my fears. You know, I also identified as a religious meditator, right? Meditating an hour, morning and night. I did that for two decades nearly, right? And then came to the point of view that I was dependent on this habit. Not that the habit was a bad habit necessarily, but I was scared that if I dropped the habit, I would lose my sense of self. So, of course, I came to the choice that I had to skip meditations and see how I felt, right? And the same with the drinking. I, I, you know, I was at a wedding and I thought, fuck it, I'll, I'll you know, have a champagne at the wedding. And, and, and I did, and I was fine, right? And now I'm, you know, and on these last trips over to the Cook Islands and stuff, we were having cocktails and having a beer some afternoons. It's okay, right? I can still do my meditation practice. I can still channel I'm still a good person, even though I have an occasional drink in a social situation where it feels uh, beneficial. It feels beneficial. It feels joyful. It feels fun. It feels okay to have a drink. Uh, and I could get to the same state with eating meat if, if, if that was appealing. At the moment, it doesn't seem to be. I don't seem to have any desire to do that. And I don't really feel that my level of... Uh, dietary control is restricting me or coming from a place of of fear-based control, right? This is what it really comes down to, fear-based control. Is it a fear-based control that's keeping you in an indoctrinated habit or, or maintaining a, a certain label, right, of who you be? Is it a fear-based control or is it a loving choice to maintain that, right, from moment-to-moment -moment choices you know, does this feel like the best thing to do? I came to a similar idea about my marriage um, back in 2011 when, when the whole yoga thing was falling apart, right? I came to the understanding of um, 
because, you know, we were having trouble at that point because we were sort of diverging and Marie left yoga much more quickly after it came out what Swamiji was doing. And I was much more resistant to leaving something that I was identifying with and something that I believed was my road to my salvation, right? This meditation and this practice and the mantra that Swamiji had given me and this lineage connection was, was how I was going to overcome feeling shit about myself, which is how I've been doing my whole life, right? I was going to achieve realization, moksha, liberation from the worldly pain. And now all of a sudden that was getting torn apart. And so I was much slower to make the decision that I had to actually leave. I was much more willing to negotiate in my own mind that, well, he's done bad things, but this is really important to me and can I work my way through it? Whereas Marie was, fuck that, we're out of here. <laughs> this guy's a fucking fraud, right? So um, that created degrees of conflict in our in our relationship. And anyway, so I was contemplating, why am I married? You know, and, and what level of... What is the <clears throat> what is the level of commitment being driven by? Is it just a promise that I made, you know, at that point 15 years ago or whatever it was, 10 years ago? Is it just a promise that I made? Is it the you know, is it my fear that if we broke up it would be bad for the children? What is driving my desire to stay with this person right now, you know? And so I had to for me personally I went through a process where I let go of vows that I'd made, promises that I'd made in ceremonies in the past, right? Marriage, this idea that it would be wrong for me to end my marriage because I realized that that level of fear-based indoctrination wasn't helping me make the conscious choice to work through the problems that were available, the challenges that I was facing. And it was much more conducive to salvaging and, and reaffirming our our relationship if I was come to, to come from a clean place where I felt I had choice to leave or stay in any particular moment and that that choice was not based on me breaking a promise, right? Because that's a fucked way, quite honestly, to, to control yourself, right? This fear of breaking a promise and the fear of what society will think of you if you break the promise. What's much more important is you come to the conclusion that staying is what would benefit me the most. Working through these problems would be much more beneficial for me than leaving in this current situation and running away from the pain that I'm not enjoying. Um, anyway, so, you know, I'm just, again, just basically ranting through my own experiences uh, to elucidate on this point of whether we can get to the place to help you all consider what's going on in your life and whether you are holding on to certain labels and, and behavioral patterns based on uh, fear-based control or whether you can move more into uh, loving choice. Anyway, Sam wrote, and interesting how our bodies reject certain foods when our personality self would prefer to keep consuming them. Even small amounts of alcohol can make me very sick now, which can be annoying. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, um, I see that um, also with um, you know comfort foods for me personally. You know, I quite often get the desire to eat something fucking heavy, oily, and sweet, right? A bit of cake, for example. Um, and yet, I know that when I do, because I do do it, right, from time to time, I I, I relinquish or, or surrender to that desire. Uh, which is coming from basically from emotion because cake is celebration food. And if you're eating cake, then you're having a celebration and it's you get it as a reward, right? You get it as a reward. It feels very satisfying when you get to eat cake or sweets or high fat foods, exact, exactly, right? It feels very comforting. It feels very, um, on an on a, on a emotional level, it feels very comforting. And yet my body really doesn't enjoy it, especially um, especially high sugar foods. I'm, I'm okay with, with fats, especially if they're okay, good fats. Um, I can eat fatty food. In fact, it actually, I actually, my body quite enjoys eating food high in fat. And when I say high in fat, I'm talking about like, <laughs> I'm talking about like almond butter and avocado. Um, <laughs> right, so it's not exactly, it's not exactly uh, fried fried food so much. Although I do enjoy some fried chips, although I probably haven't had fried chips, uh, potato chips fried for 
I don't know, a month at least. Probably when we were away we ate them, but I can't remember getting a thing of chips. Anyway, um, so the point being, <clears throat> we do have desires to do things and it's interesting to recognize why we desire to do things. Is it to fit in with others, right? And we do that as well, right? Everyone's having a drink, I wanna have a drink. No, nope, my body doesn't really enjoy alcohol at the moment. Um, and to recognize that and then not to feel socially awkward or is it an emotional desire that, that that particular food or beverage or whatever gives us um, a sense of uh, emotional well-being, whether that's a reward or whether that's a dampening down. You know, quite often when I've done a high-level um, facilitation, I need to eat afterwards to ground myself. Interestingly, last night I didn't. I, I thought I would. So, because last night it was seven o'clock when I started, so seven till eight, basically, I was doing the light language transmission. Eight o'clock at night is way too late for me to eat. But I was probably prepared that I would eat after, and yet I didn't. I jumped in our spa, actually, for the first time. I haven't shown you that. But I, um, it's a little project I've had. We got a spa very, very cheaply, um, spa bath, uh, what, what, what would you call it in? A jacuzzi, I think you call it in America, right? Um, I got it very, very cheaply because A, it was leaking, B, the heater didn't work, right? It had a few problems. It's pretty scuffed up and it's quite old. It's from 2003, so it's it's 19 years old, this um, sauna, uh, not sauna, spa bath slash jacuzzi. Anyway, so I've worked through fixing it. I, got, I fixed the leaks. I got new O-rings and et cetera. Um, had to clean it out completely. We've got some special stuff that you, you know, run through all of the pipe work to get any crap out of it because this is an old spa and I have no idea how badly it's been treated in the past. Um, got the heater working, you know, which involved quite a lot of diagnostics on my part. Um, <clears throat> had to rebuild the cover because the cover was so, so heavy. The foam had sucked up all of this water and it was a, incredibly heavy. It's still there. And I had got new polystyrene. I wasn't prepared to buy a new cover because a new cover was going to cost me a thousand bucks, which is more than what I spent on the whole friggin' pool. But, um, and it's undercover, so it doesn't really need the cover for keeping the rain and stuff off. It just needs insulation so that we can heat it economically. Uh, anyway, so I got foam and redid all of that. Anyway, um, I've treated it, the water with uh, ionic silver, colloidal silver. So I've got a colloidal silver generator. I'm generating my own colloidal silver and, and treating the water and testing it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. New filters, all of that. So last night was the first time I actually got in it. <laughs> it was very, very nice. Straight after the, um, after the light language or 15 minutes after, um, sitting out there in the dark in my nice hot and the and the jets in one seat anyway the jets work really really well it doesn't work so well in some of the other seats but this is something else to keep tinkering with and seeing if I can work out whether the hoses to those are a little bit restricted or kinked or something I have to pull some more covers off and have a look at that um, there's another project <laughs> another opportunity for me to keep making this uh, spa bath uh, more and more functional so overall, the whole thing has cost, you know, less than a thousand bucks and they're like 10,000 bucks new if I was to buy the same thing. So I'm quite happy with this little project that's kept me entertained, <laughs> kept me entertained over the last two weeks. Uh, we got it just before I got COVID. Um, and so obviously it sat there for over a week, not even being touched after we managed to get it home. And that was an adventure in itself, right? On a trailer, because uh, the whole thing, they weigh, they're freaking heavy. Uh, took uh, me and uh, the boys and two of their friends. So there was uh, what five of us in total to get it up onto our deck. When I rebuilt the deck, I strengthened the deck so that the deck could take the weight of the spa pool. And Lucas helped me run a lead out to it because it has to be 15 amps. And so we, yeah. So anyway, I did, but the point is I didn't eat last night. I haven't eaten yet this morning, so... Um, maybe I'm losing that because that was always quite habitual after doing light language sessions, like group sessions and stuff straight after I needed to eat to ground myself back down. And now potentially I'm overcoming um, that thing. Yes, it is a therapy pool. I'm thinking of whether I'm, I need to do some more research on whether the colloidal silver will handle um, some magnesium salts going in the pool and whether the magnesium salts, whether the filter and the heater, which is stainless steel, the heater tube is stainless steel, whether and the inside of the pump, etc., would handle magnesium salts. 
So that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have it full of magnesium salts. That would be ideal. I'm going to go back to your comment from earlier. Sam, here it is. It's a great opportunity to choose to listen to our individual body's needs and honour them instead of listening to social pressures or other outer should do's. Yeah, and I'd add to that um, our emotional desires as well and sometimes our mental desires, which is to follow the social pressures or to follow the habits, right? What our parents did, how we've been indoctrinated, right? Recognising that the what is actually recognizing what is actually um driving the desire that i'm currently feeling you know that's i think that's where the inquiry is at that's that's where living mindfully really comes in is whether we can recognize that i'm feeling a desire to do something or to avoid something you know um Oh, awesome, Betty. I'm glad that you're just preparing a magnesium salt bath. So I'm hopeless. I won't bother running a bath at home. Marie does. Um, but if the spa pool's there and it's hot and it's ready to go, then, yeah, I'm going to get in it. Um, but, yeah, actually running a bath is seems like too much. <laughs> I don't know why. But anyway, um, maybe I've got some... Yeah, I've never been a bath person. Maybe I've got some some programming around that anywho um yeah going back to the point recognizing or being aware of what is driving our desires i think is very very foundational to living a conscious life right to being more conscious and, and that's what i would describe spiritual as i define a, a spiritual person is someone who lives consciously in my opinion right someone who is tuned into the spirit of things not necessarily doing woo woo shit but but basically living consciously rather than living on autopilot rather than being overly influenced by the rules and doctrines and influences coming from from other sources whether that be historic programming or whether that be social pressures or cosmic events even you know what if, if you're just doing what you quote unquote feel to do which can be emotional can be mental social pressures can be societal pressures can be your habits basically habits come through as a feeling right you don't you don't actually think oh i should do this it it, it operates beyond the thinking beyond conscious thinking anyway it's sort of like subconscious thinking i guess subconscious programming and most of us live most of our life you know completely controlled by our subconscious thinking which is not really conscious um, and so the way to evolve and to become more conscious in life is to be willing to be aware and, and, and stop ourselves in moments when we are about to embark on something that we feel the desire to do or if we're trying to avoid something that we are averse to doing. Why? Why? What is driving this? You know, good, honest, internal inquiry. Why am I averse to this? Why am I desiring this? What is stimulating my desire in this moment? Is it an intuitive feeling from my body? Is it an emotional desire? Is it a subconscious program running? Is it pressure from society? Is it just an old habit? Sometimes our bodies do things habitually, right? We do things habitually. And you can say, oh, yeah, I'm just doing what my body wants to do, right? I'm following my body's cue here. But it's a habit, and that includes eating shit too. Uh, includes the way we brush our teeth, all sorts of things we do very, very habitually. Chewing our nails, for example. Body habit. Body finds comfort in doing things that it always does. And it feels stabilizing to our psyche as well when our body is doing things that are comfortable and known. It's hard to break out of habits, whether they be subconscious mental habits, whether they be emotional habits, or whether they be physical habits. Our posture, right, feels comfortable to be slouched because we've been slouching for several decades now. It doesn't feel comfortable to straighten out and sit up straight and align our posture. Even though it would be beneficial, it's not what our body wants to do anymore because our body has become habituated to a certain posture, right? And so... It's not just about doing what we feel in our bodies. It's not just about doing what we feel emotionally. It's not even about doing, you know, what we obviously not about doing what we feel from a subconscious programming point of view. It's can we become aware and then make conscious choice 
about what we do, even though it's going to be uncomfortable, especially at first. Sam said, interesting because food was an opportunity to assert control in my life. Yeah, food is something that we all associate with control, even from young kids, right? Get to control a lot of things based on whether they say yes or no to certain foods, right? Children get to assert their will. They get to develop their egoic sense of self by saying yes or no to certain foods. Parents saying, please eat your vegetable. Child says no. And they have power in that moment because they can see that their parents desperately want them to eat the vegetables. And they can sense that they have the power in this situation when they get to say no to something that their parents deeply want them to do. Right? Eat the vegetables. Because the parents lovingly want the child to be healthy. Now the parents are in this quandary. What do we do now? Do we force the child to eat the vegetables, right? And apply our will over their will, right? And this develops a whole conflict that can quite often be quite aggressive and violent in all sorts of ways. Because the parent doesn't understand the mentality of the child wanting to find a sense of self and using this opportunity as uh, as an outlet for that because potentially they don't have many other outlets. And this is one of the most highly charged outlets for a three-year-old is their ability to say yes or no to when they open their mouth to the next spoonful of food. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Now, it's incredibly frustrating then. <laughs> How do we work with that, right? How do we give the child the opportunity to develop their will and not have to use declining certain foods that would be beneficial to them as that opportunity? Fascinating, right? And then to recognize how that potentially has been carried forward from childhood where it was a very powerful way of exerting your will over situations against authority, right? Your parents, so that you could claim some sovereignty in yourself and your ability to whether open your mouth or not and say yes or no to certain foods, right? That is an important, that was a powerful tool that you had at your disposal in developing your ego and your sense of self and your ability to control your external world. Um, and many people have still carried that forward, right? Their ability to say yes or no to certain foods has is still entangled with this idea that they have control, that they have a, 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 an aspect of power over, over their life and over how life goes on around them, what foods they're willing to eat and what foods they won't eat. Do they really still uh, take the time to inquire whether their body actually wants that food or not? Right? But no, I don't eat mushrooms. <laughs> It's just a belief system now because as a child, they chose that they didn't like mushrooms and therefore that was a thing and that was an identifying factor. Oh, no, they don't eat mushrooms, right? That's part of their persona now. The child that doesn't eat mushrooms, right? It's something that differentiates them, something that their parents have to go to trouble to avoid mushrooms in anything that they eat, right? So that the family has to, you know, mushrooms have to be taken out or whatever it might be, whether it be tomatoes or fucking whatever, right? Corn, doesn't matter. Something that someone doesn't eat is becomes a point of individuality that a lot of people cling to when they're not feeling that they're, um, not feeling that they're recognized for individual talents in other ways, but they're recognized for a food preference, which has become a rule in their life. And many of them carry it all the way to their grave, right? A choice that they made when they were three years old and it just became uh, an identifying part of their persona, their psyche, right? And they weren't able to overcome that and, and allow themselves to experience mushrooms or anything else for that matter further on. Of course, potentially it might be for some of the people that their bodies really reacted badly to mushrooms and it was completely um, appropriate for them to avoid mushrooms for the rest of their life. I'm not saying, you know, or anything else. I'm not saying that that's 
all food preferences have come from just an uh, egoic identification and ability to control their world around them and to give them a sense of power. But I believe in many cases it is, right? And it isn't actually. And maybe even some of the uh, allergic reaction or at least the, the reaction people have to uh, uh, inadvertently eating one of the foods that they've chosen that they shouldn't eat, couldn't eat, didn't want to eat um, was more psychoschematic than actual uh, biological, right? If you've decided since the age of two or three that you can't eat mushrooms and then all of a sudden you eat mushrooms, you're likely to throw up, right? Because you've just done something that is totally repugnant to the sense of being that you be. Um, and so you could say, no, 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 I'm allergic to mushrooms. I can't eat them. <laughs> you've created the, that situation where you can't eat mushrooms because you chose not to eat them when you were young and that choice seemed to serve you um, in, a, in creating an identity that you're not willing to let go of. As an inquiry, my friends, I'm not laying down the law here. I'm just, I'm just potentially uh, opening up ideas that you might be willing to um, look at. And, and, you know, I know I've been talking a lot about food and alcohol. Uh, I don't know why, because the vegetarian thing was personal to me. But, um, and it is an interesting, and it is a highly charged topic. Food is a very charged topic. You know, food is so important to us on all sorts of levels, um, both to maintain our biology, but also uh, emotionally, you know, and, and psychoschematically. Food is, a, is an important thing um, and is highly charged. And many people, you know, really struggle with, with even contemplating that their diet might not be the best diet um, and that their diet is quite unquote wrong or they're doing the wrong thing in their diet, etc. People really get defensive. Um, but the, the, the discussion itself is, is designed to be beyond diet um, and to encompass all sorts of habits and indoctrinations that you may be maintaining. And the point here is, can you get into the why, the deeper why and why you are choosing to do these? How much entanglement with subconscious belief systems, indoctrinations is there and potentially back into past life programming as well? Um, as childhood stuff um, is is really influencing how you can show up in any particular moment of now, right? Can can we inquire into what is driving us and how big an influence that has on us, and and what would it what would it mean if we were to overcome, you know, if we were to challenge and overcome some of these belief systems that we've taken as as law and rules and part of our identity. And what it would take for us to relax out of those, to expand out of those, to move beyond those, not necessarily to fight our way through them because they're wrong. You know, I'm trying to get out of this idea that habits are wrong. They're not. They're, they're normal and natural. But can we slowly evolve out of being overly influenced by our habits so that we can become much more intuitive and much more open in moments to act in ways that are... That are beneficial to ourselves and those around us. Sam said, it's important to me. I used to punish myself with food, either starving myself or binge eating, all connected to my not good enoughs. Yeah. Yep. 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 It is, it is a powerful tool, food. And, you know, self-harm in general is a powerful tool whether we're doing it with food or doing it in other ways, right? Some of us exercise, over-exercise. I used to, you know, as a child. And I know you like to run as well, Sam, and how much of that has been, you know, influenced in these ways of not good enough. How often have we pushed ourselves in exercise to try and maybe to punish ourselves, but quite often to prove ourselves beyond the not good enough that we feel. You know, I know myself, I used to run myself into the fucking ground, um, almost trying to escape my own mentality, right? To, to enjoy the exhaustion on the other side of, of doing that, right? Um, as a young person um, in my you know, late teens and early 20s, I would go and run for an hour and a half. And I mean run to, 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 to exhaustion. Um, not good for my body. <laughs> not at all. Not a loving thing to do. Not at all. People say, oh, you're exercising. Great. 
yeah, you're building stamina, great. You know, such a good athlete, great. Yeah, what's driving it? What's driving these, you know, virtuous things like exercise? What's driving it? Self-hatred. <laughs> it's not healthy, you know? And yes, now, today, I exercise because I love to exercise because my body enjoys getting out and moving because I recognize the benefit in exercising, right? But exercise is not good or bad. Exercise is what it is. What's driving it? What's the reason behind it, right? Yeah, didn't feel enough unless I was half dead, right? Didn't feel that you'd given it your all. Didn't feel that you'd tried hard enough. Didn't feel that you'd, you know, succeeded in quote-unquote exercise unless you're, you know, half dead at the end of it. And then you had a sense of satisfaction that I really did a good time. I really ran hard. And, and, and now in this state of exhaustion, I can finally relax, basically because I've got no energy to worry about anything. <laughs> And I've got a little bit of reprieve from my mind, you know, putting myself into this stressed state, right? Biologically stressed has now uh, come, I've broken down at the end of it. And in that breakdown, artificially induced by over-exercising, I, I find relief, you know, I did that for years um, until my knees basically gave out and I couldn't run anymore. Thankfully, I recognized that earlier rather than later and didn't actually completely destroy my knees. Um, thankfully. Now it's great to go out for a short run and just enjoy the feeling of moving my body. Exactly. So we've matured through these situations. But self-harm in general, that's what I was basically talking about, as a, as a mechanism for uh, controlling the world around us to overcome the sense of out of control um, is very common, right? And whether that self-harm is uh, drinking or, or using drugs um, or smoking or any, you know, overuse of stimulants or, or depressants, etc., etc., or exercise or eating or actually uh, hurting ourselves, you know, there's all sorts of ways that we self-harm in order to exert a level of control that we feel that we are lacking and that we need. Sam said, it's useful to have the comparison of states of mind. Yeah, I, I, I do believe it's it's useful to, to draw these comparisons to help us evolve our awareness so that we can recognize now moving forward what's driving me today. What's what's instigating this desire to go through with this particular activity or to, to have this response or reaction to a certain challenge or situation that's, a, that's arisen in front of me right now? Because as we do these inquiries, we're much more likely to recognize whether we're operating from fearful control or loving choice, right? We're much more um, likely to recognize what drives you know, the control freak within us, what, what level of fear, what level of, of lack is driving that desire to create control around us. And so with that level of awareness, we now have a level of conscious choice as to whether we uh, uh, surrender to that desire to be the control freak in order to gain a level of, you know, satisfaction or emotional reprieve from, from the situation of not feeling good enough or whether we um, choose to tackle it uh, more consciously and 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 lovingly help ourselves through, you know, that aspect that wants to stand up and control things because we are feeling a lack inside of ourselves right now. Can we can we satisfy that lack in more wholesome ways, in more spiritual ways, in more complete ways, in more uh, intrinsic ways, right? Rather than trying to control the world around us to to appease the sense of self that's in fear, can we alleviate those fears in more constructive ways, right? By doing deep meditations and recognizing that that fear is just coming up to release, that fear is not the truth of us, that we are connected to something much more uh, implicitly safe and secure. And so, you know, this, this is the game, developing awareness 
maintaining acceptance, which runs sort of sometimes contrary because as we develop awareness, we want to reject what we become aware of. And the other side of the coin, the awareness coin is acceptance. Can we accept what we're aware of and then choose to act differently? So again, people re recoil from the word acceptance because they think if they're going to accept something, then they're stuck with it. No, you're not, right? So you have to be aware first, then you have to accept it. This is what is, it is what it is, right? I don't need to make this wrong. Now I'm at conscious choice. Just because I've accepted it doesn't mean I need to let it control me. I now can, can apply my deeper, more foundational will to choose how I act in this moment, right? Beyond my awareness of the fear, even though I'm accepting that there's fear in my field, I recognize that it doesn't have to overly influence me. That's spiritual evolution. <laughs> That's all it is. It is pre pretty simple. It's pretty simple, but it's not always easy to do. And so here we are. And so we're going to work tomorrow. We have a call uh, starting at the same time this call started. So an hour. So in 23 hours, I'll put it that way, we'll be uh, showing up tomorrow on instant teleseminars. No. Yes. Yes, it is tomorrow. <laughs> 23 hours time, we'll be showing up to do a call on peace and really attaining this balance between our sovereignty, being sovereign and authentically confident in our sovereignty and being an advocate for peace so that we can have peace and we can uh, radiate peace and we can um, advocate for peace without being a people pleaser, without, without having to sacrifice our own desires in order to maintain what we think is peace, which is what we've done in the past, right? Keep the peace. I'm a peacekeeper. No, we don't want to be a peacekeeper. We want to be an advocate for peace that is willing to work through conflict because conflict is inevitable. Conflict is inevitable. Aggression and violence is optional. We're choosing to advocate for peace in a way that can deal with conflict in non-aggressive ways, in non-forceful ways, in ways that brings more consciousness, right? to the process of negotiating conflict, both for ourselves internally and for our societies around us. Because this is, a, first and foremost, it's an internal process. Can we work with ourselves in non-aggressive ways? Can we be willing to be aware of the conflict we're carrying within us, right? Not needing to hide ourselves from the conflict, not needing to brush over it with, oh, I'm all peaceful, I'm all peaceful, because we're in denial of our internal conflicts, right? We need to face, accept that there's conflict in us. And now can we face these internal conflicts without being aggressive and violent internally? Can we be loving? Can we expand out of the fear and, and lovingly negotiate the conflicts that we're carrying inside of ourselves. Because when we can do that, then we can very, very effectively do the same in our external world. And if enough of us start doing that, we will have world peace, right? We will have a situation where we're not using aggression, violence to settle conflicts. But not until. We can't work on the external world. We're not gonna achieve world peace by protesting against war and saying that war is wrong and it's bad and it should stop, right? <laughs> We're not going to fight war to achieve to drop out. We're going to have to embody peace, true peace, in order to effectively advocate for peaceful outcomes in the external world. That's what we're going to be dealing with this month of April, my friends. That's our topic and I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I think it's really going to challenge us all um, me included. I've been quite challenged by it over the last week or so that I've been inquiring down this line. Um, and so I'm looking forward to bringing that challenge to the table and allowing us all to evolve through various conversations that we will have in the starting with a topic call tomorrow, but then in the meditations and the Q&A and, and the ongoing chat with Matt, um, whatever we call these, drops of light. Now, next week end probably not going to be doing drops of light, my friends, because I'm going to be on retreat. Um, I've got a four day retreat that starts uh, on the Thursday and finishes on the Sunday or the Monday. Anyway, it's four days and it's in that period of time. Pretty sure it starts Thursday morning and ends Monday morning. 
if that's four days. Um, <laughs> so I won't be available next weekend. I'll be on retreat down in the Able Tasman. Uh, we'll be kayaking. Hopefully we see the baby seals again and we get good weather and walking in the park and seeing the birds, the kaka, etc, etc. Going to the Roo Walker resurgence and jumping in the nine degrees Celsius water for a little bit of cold therapy. A little bit of challenge, help people find their inner courage and their inner uh, fortitude. So yeah, look, it's going to be fun. We've got 20 odd people coming for a retreat uh, next weekend. So Marie's already down there. I'm going to head down there on Wednesday after drops of light, after chat with Matt. Anyway, friends, so now you know everything about my life. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Much love and support to you all. Bye for now, friends. Bye-bye. Reach out if you need any help.